today Christina is here, she's in the back, you can recognize her. In case you haven't uh, filled in your reimbursement forms, you can do so today. And um, there is uh, going to be a photograph uh, of everyone here and also of the online participants. So that will happen just before lunch. So I'll remind you again uh, at 12, but we'll go out on the terrace and take the picture and then people who are online can, can have uh, their picture taken by the IT uh, people here. Then there is a conference dinner tonight at seven and we're just going to meet at the restaurant. And the restaurant is just, uh, just here basically, uh, right uh, on this side of uh, the institute. You, you go out, you go towards the sea and it's there on your, uh, yeah, I'm just next to you, good. So then uh, the, the chair of the session is Hugues uh, Potier. Yes, hello, so I'm Hugues Potier from uh, CA Saclay. And uh, the first speaker uh, will be uh, uh, Stéphane Virali from Sherbrooke and uh, Montréal on time domain quantum microwave. So please. Yes. Hi, uh, so can you hear me? Yeah. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Stéphane Virali. Probably you don't know me, it's normal. Uh, <laughs> but um, I've been working, uh, I'm, res uh, I'm now affiliated with Polytechnique Montréal, but I used to be uh, working at University of Sherbrooke. And, um, and most of the, uh, the work that's been done and that I will present here comes from uh, Sherbrooke. So it used to work, but it doesn't now. So. Okay, um, so I, I'm basically a spokesperson for a group of real scientists. So the most important, I guess, for this project is Bertrand Relais, who you probably know. Um, so he's at Université de Sherbrooke, uh, working on uh, noise in microwave, uh, microwave circuits. And uh, most of the work has been done, really, by two uh, PhD students, Jean-Olivier Simoneau, who is now working uh, for a uh, quantum company because there's a huge uh, uh, amount of new quantum companies in Sherbrooke that, that, um, that I just spawned in, in, the, in, the, in the last uh, couple of years. And Simon bolduc Baudouin is uh, the current PhD student on the project. So the slides, a few slides that I will show you are coming from here. Uh, now I'm at Polytechnique Montréal, I'm working with Denis Seletsky. Maybe some of you know, know him, he's in ultra-fast photonics, and we have a very good uh, uh, PhD student also who's working on it. But so uh, everything that I will talk about, um, basically we discuss all of us uh, on these things, and uh, it's the fruit of a lot of, uh, a long time of reflection. So. Uh, the motivation for this talk, and also to try to motivate you to, to listen to the talk up to the end, um, the idea is to try to, um, to work now quantum optics or quantum photonics or quantum microwaves, depending on the support we're working in, um, with very short pulses. Um, and the good thing is in microwaves is uh, because we're so low in, in frequency, we can really probe those uh, short pulses um, relatively well. Um, so because, because these systems are very useful, uh, uh, because we're going to be able to probe fast dynamics, uh, stuff like that, uh, we want to understand um, these, uh, these pulses in, in, a quantum, in a quantum way. Also, QED is usually cast in space and time, so we really want to be able to, to, to have a good description of what happens to light when it interacts in small volumes of, of space and time. And, um, and also, as you will see, uh, because we started working on this uh, time domain, uh, which is a bit different point of view from whatever exists in general in the, in the literature, we already have found some surprises and, uh, and there are probably more to come. So this is basically what we started with. 
Bertrand, it, it started with Bertrand and I having a conversation about, about this. Uh, Bertrand says, said to me, you know, I can send a pulse that's as, as short as I want uh, in, a, in a microwave line. And, um, and, and I want to understand how it works in, in terms of quantum. For instance, we will see, usually the Hamiltonian is, is, is shown as to be uh, h equals h bar omega times n. And what is the omega that's associated with the pulse that's so short that it has a huge amount of frequencies available? And we'll see that the answer, uh, in the very beginning, the answer seemed to be very, very easy. We just take an average or something like that, but it has n absolutely nothing to do uh, with that in reality. So let's start with that. Uh, in books, we have this, uh, if I forget the uh, one half, uh, uh, we have this relation. Uh, if, you, if you open a quantum optics book and you and you uh, go f a few pages, you will find this relationship. And books are a very dangerous thing because in, in, the, in, in the end, you will, you will end up really believing that it's true. And, uh, and it's not. And, and, and it took me a lot of time to figure out that it's not, that it's not true. Um, it's true in, in, some, sen in some settings. Uh, uh, when thought quantization is done in the frequency domain. And that's usually the case of all the books that you encounter in the literature, so from Cohen Energy to, uh, I should not do this, uh, to Fox or whatever. Uh, you will find um, that first quantization is done in the frequency domain or in the case space, if you want. And, um, and you end up with this kind of, uh, of relation. But so the energy is, in this case, is proportional to the number of photons. The reason why it's true is because you have, of course, given a very definite uh, frequency to your photons. So, of course, you can say that if I measure a photon in, the, in this mode, it will have the energy h bar omega. But in reality, um, of course, photons are not quanta of energy. We, we all know that. and. Um, and there is no real relationship between uh, the Hamiltonian and the number of photons. If I take something that's very broad, my Hamiltonian is going to be uh, a sum of the h bar omega, n of omega, and n, the, f the, the total number of photons, is just the integral of uh, all the n's at all omegas. And they're not proportional. So this idea that we have all that H and N are proportional, it's just not true. Uh, it's, it's true only in very, very specific circumstances. And the circumstances do not apply to the type of research that we do with very uh, broad pulses. So what gives them? Um, the first thing is we know that energy is basically the square of the electromagnetic field, so we do E squared plus B squared, basically, and we have the, the energy of, uh, of our um, EM field. But the number of photons are something else. They are the square of another field, which I call the photonic field, but, you yeah. um, and know. And, and it carries information the same way the, the EM field does. But it's not the same one, and we'll see the relationship between the two. But uh, so that, that's where we started. We started with, so what is this weird thing, photonic field, that really gives me the, the, the photonic field will give me the, um, the, the probability of seeing a click on a detector, and the electromagnetic field will give me the probability of measuring some, some type, some energy in the, in the EM field. Oops. So um, how, do we, how do we relate the two fields? So I will, um, I will now go to the microwave domain. And in the microwave domain, the, the main thing that we can measure from the EM field is, uh, is the voltage. But it has the same structure as uh, as the electric field or the magnetic field, for instance. 
And the important thing is that inside of the, uh, of the expression of, of the voltage, there's this uh, pesky square root of h bar omega term that exists and that multiplies all the, the frequencies. Uh, whereas in the photonic field, the, the field that we really want to represent the number of photons, there's this, this factor doesn't appear. It's just straightforwardly the, the, the quadratures of the, uh, of the field without, without any, uh, without any um, um, dimension. So how do we go from here to here? So we have this square root of h bar omega. So the best thing to do is to divide by the square root of h bar omega. And that's exactly what we can do, actually. So when we do that, basically what we do is we, we have a transform. We have a convolution in time domain with a one, something that is the, the uh, Fourier transform of 1 over h bar omega. And it happens to be 1 over uh, t, the uh, square root of t, basically. So from the time domain perspective, we can transform the voltage into things that resemble the quadrature of, the, uh, of the, the photonic field that will give us real information about photons, how, how we would measure clicks on, on detectors. Uh, the big problem is that those are non-local, obviously, and non-causal relations. So it's a, it's a bit weird. There's a, there's a non-causal relation between the photonic field and the uh, EM field, which means that we basically need information from the past and from the future. But it's not the first time we encounter this kind of, of problem in, in electrodynamics. Um, but if we, if we implement this, uh, this relation, uh, we, can, we can measure. Uh, we can measure um, clicks, the, 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 the equivalent of clicks on, on detectors. One of these, uh, this one, uh, commutes with V at all times. And that's very important because what we can do is what we can uh, register a trace of, of V over time. And then we can apply this transform. And if we have a Wigner function that is, uh, that is uh, rotationally symmetric, for instance, we only need one quadrature to be able to measure, to, to do a full tomography of the, um, of, the, um, of the state. And we can, from V, obtain Q, one of the quadratures, and check whether we have the, the good relations for uh, photon numbers when we, when we do that. So just, uh, this was just a slide about uh, the non-causal uh, relation uh, between V and, uh, and, and, and the quadratures of the photonic field. Uh, I interestingly, when we, when we do something, just a simple pulse like that, um, the, the probability of finding a photon is exactly maximum when the voltage is uh, equal to zero. But so we wanted to test this, uh, this thing, and uh, we decided to do it on a tunnel junction, which is basically the, the you know, it's the job of, of Bertrand to look at these things. Uh, tunnel junction is really what, what makes him tick. So when we bias a, a tunnel junction with a DC and AC signal, uh, we have three wave mixing taking place. So we can, for instance, uh, send a 12 gigahertz uh, AC signal, and we, can, uh, and we can measure pairs of photons at, let's say, two, two at six gigahertz, or one at four and one at eight, or we can go down to two and 10. Um, we're, we're just limited by, the, uh, by this, the, the, the setup that we have. And uh, when we do that, we can uh, collect the traces and uh, apply the voltage transforms that I showed you before. And, um, and, and then we, we can check that we have the real, the, the good relationships for, um, for um, photons. So just the setup, 
the idea is that you can, we can uh, um, send both um, um, uh, DC and AC on, on the tunnel junction here, and then we send everything back to a very, very fast acquisition card, 32 giga samples per second, and we have a 12 gigahertz um, bandwidth. So we can basically measure everything. Well, not the low frequencies because we're limited by our amplifiers. And here is the result. So let's say I, I send a 12 gigahertz uh, pulse onto my, uh, on my junction. And as I said, I will have pairs at 6 gigahertz. I will have pairs that, are, that span 4 and 8, for instance. Um, and, um, and so I should be able to, if, I, if I'm clever and if I decide to filter correctly my signal, I should be able to, um, to recover um, the equivalent of single mode squeezing, so pairs that appear, um, pairs of photon that appear all the time uh, in, in all, the, in all the, 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 the frequencies that I want. So, for instance, if I go at 6 gigahertz, it's already there. Just if I have a narrowband filter around 6 gigahertz, I should see pairs of photons, and that's what I see here. So there's a, there's a small contribution for a thermal state at 65 millik. But other than that, the Fano factor at uh, 0 should be close. It's, it's, it's not 1, clearly not 1. It's close to 2. And, um, and the reason is that we, we are generating pairs of photons. Now we can do that at six gigahertz, but if we do that at eight gigahertz, which is, you know, we, we should have a, a normal thermal state because if you take just one mode um, of, a, of a two mode squeeze state, you will have a thermal state. So the, the final factor should be one, and that's what we recover. Now we could go to four and eight gigahertz. So what we do is we have a filter, a, a numerical a digital filter that uh, goes, that's by Gaussian around four and eight. And we, we do the same thing on the trace with that, that, that uh, simple filter. And we recover the statistics of pairs of photons because we have now a mode, a full mode that is both four and eight gigahertz and uh, that will generate pairs of photons. If we do that for, with five and eight, for instance, which, is, which does not correspond to pairs that should be created uh, at the same time, we, don't, we, we recover the, the, thermal, the thermal statistics. So we've shown that, uh, and, and of course, I, um, I don't show you here because we have a problem with the curve, but uh, there's, no, there's no such thing as the same relationships if we do, if we do that with just V. If we, if we use V squared as a proxy for the number of photons, we don't recover these, these relationships. We have to implement the, 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 uh, the transforms that I talked about. So let's go to, to another subject, the quadratures in the time domain, uh, because that was uh, the question that we asked for, for ourselves uh, uh, a lot of, uh, for, for a long time. Um, we discovered that they are Hilbert transform of, of one another, which is not surprising. Uh, when you think about it, but uh, in the very beginning, it was not clear to us. So the idea is if you have a quasi-monochromatic um, system, you have two quadratures. You have, beside, you have basically the cosine and the sine. And if you, do, if you go in the frequency domain, um, basically you have the cosine is just two real parts, and the sine is uh, uh, two imaginary parts, one positive, the other one negative on the, on the other side. Um, if, if, if we want something that is very short, so here I, uh, I will show you a frequency comb because um, I think it's easier to see. So you can have a very wide spectrum. You can have very different, you can have very uh, strange relations between the, 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 the phase relations between the frequencies. But the idea is that the the, 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 the quadrature is the Hilbert transform. So the, basically the orange and the uh, blue lines are 90 degrees from, from one another. And uh, I have this neat animation to try and show 
to give you an idea of what quadratures are in the, in the, in the time domain. So now if we want to go full time, so we decide that we, um, we go to the opposite direction of uh, frequency, we, we do just time, um, we realize that uh, energy was an observable for, for frequency domain, and time of arrival of photons is, is a, a, um, um, an observable for, um, for, for the time domain. And uh, I call that uh, graphene single photon detector because it has, uh, you know, it has a wide band going from zero to infinity. So it's an ideal detector with infinite bandwidth should be able to, to, to recover this, uh, these times of arrival. So, it, so if we have um, the, the Hamiltonian, which is equal to the sum of h bar omega, a dag omega, a omega, a dag omega, a omega, we can think about something like theta, which would be an average sum of the time of arrival of our, of our photons. And it would be the, basically the dual of the Hamiltonian in the, in the time domain. And interestingly, uh, there's a nice um, commutation relation between the two. Um, uh, and th that was surprising because we thought there was no commutation relation between the uh, uh, Hamiltonian and time. <coughs> There's a good argument for that, but this commutation relation is not as problematic as the one that people think about, which usually uh, doesn't include the n here. So, um, so this is this is a valid commutation um, relation, and uh, I find it neat because I think it shows very well that uh, what we measure n the the, the number of photons is really a, a number of uh, action. Now if, we, if I want to go beyond uh, what we've done and do a full tomography of the field, so we, I want to measure both quadratures, for instance, in the frequency domain I know that I can do um, homodyne detection with the local oscillator. So I send a local oscillator, I, I split it in two, there's one part that has a pi over two shift the other part I leave alone, and then I mix that um, uh, on, on beam splitter with, uh, with my signal, and I get, and I recover the, uh, the, the two quadratures. Uh, I can also inverse the signal and the LO, so I can apply the pi over two shift on the, on the signal. It's, it's, it's going to give us the same thing. Now in time domain, it's more difficult. Uh, one of the things that I do, that we do with Bertrand, we measure, we measure uh, voltages. So when we measure voltages, we have, um, we measure one point, and we can do the same thing with electro optic sampling in in in, uh, in optics, uh, basically sending a, a, a Dirac and uh, sampling the field at, at one time. The problem with and and the way to 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 recover the the to recover the quadratures is to do the Hilbert transform. But as I said, it's non-causal, so it's not obvious how do you do that. There is a device that's called the hybrid that we've talked about two, two days ago that actually does this, but it has to be very wide band to be able to do that. Um, I'm not going to discuss this. The last thing I wanted to show you is uh, something that you've, you've heard about a lot, um, you, you, when you have a coherent state, you can see nice figures in the literature that, that look like this. But this, this figure is, a, in, is an actual uh, well, simulation of uh, what would happen in time domain. It's not like the figures that we've seen in the literature where basically those wiggles would, be, would correspond to uh, measuring um, the, the changing the phase uh, of, of our measurement. Here, let's say I have a sine wave and it's a coherent state. If I, if I put it on a, on a, um, uh, on a oscilloscope, I should see exactly this, this type of, of trace. If I have a squeeze state, for instance, we all know that we have this kind of here, the, 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 the state is squeezed in, in amplitude, so we would recover this kind of, uh, of thing. Uh, but I just wanted to show you this because I, 
I think it's beautiful. It's the, it's the cat state. Because I always ask myself, what is a cat state? Because it's a, it's a plus alpha and a minus alpha. And I couldn't, I, I, so it looks like it should be zero all the time. But it's, it's far from being zero all the time. The, the signal that we are looking for in, in a second in quantization is really in the noise. And that's the specialty of, of Bertrand. Um, that's it. I didn't want to go further than this. Okay, questions? Thank you for the nice talk. Maybe it's a stupid question, but if it's a formality, when, when you uh, go from a frequency domain to time domain, you need to do this I mean, integral with, I mean, the frequency range is going from infinite to, to, to minus infinity in a way. But it is not true. I mean, you have a, 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 a width on a window of frequencies. So, I mean, in a way, you have also restrictions for your, I mean, mm -hmm. formalism. Uh, you're absolutely right. So um, that's why I went full time only uh, after I showed you some, some, some uh, actual uh, uh, measurements that we did. So if you go full time, you have this paradigm with the, the, the theta and, the, and the, the time of arrival that you can measure. But you, in order to do that, you have to have infinite bandwidth, as you said. Um, and in general, you're in between. You're, you're, so, but the idea is that we want to have tools to treat that in between. Instead of just saying, okay, it's, it's almost monochromatic, so there's an omega, average omega, and then we treat the stuff just as if it was monochromatic. We want it to be able to have a full description in time or in, in frequency, and, um, and, and that's why we're, we're doing it like that. Um, you mentioned that you have this a causal connection between the you know the voltage and the quadratures, and maybe I mean you, you start with definitions in terms of Fourier transforms, which are a is an a causal transform. Um, did you think about or have you considered? I mean, could you do definite start with a Laplace transform and then get a, a causal theory? Uh, I've never thought of that, so I. <laughs> it it it's possible. Uh, and now that you mentioned it, uh, but I've never looked at it this way. Uh, yeah, here. So uh, whenever you open a, a signal processing book, you, you learn about the, the window function of the FFT or the Fourier transform in yes. general. So maybe it's a dumb question, but how is this different from a window function? I mean, your, the fact that you need to take the integral properly? Um, no, uh, it's not just a window. What would be exactly the same thing as the window function? The uh, I mean, taking, taking. Basically, the. Ah, yeah, yeah. So taking a very. Well, or. Uh, or uh, I mean, the, 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 as far as I understand, but maybe again, yeah. it's a dumb question, but as far as I understand, the point of the window function in signal processing is to avoid this. A cause other things because it, it restricts yourself to the proper frequency range. So basically, you don't have any problem anymore. So how is this different or no, the but same? Let's say you have a very wide signal. So I have a, um, I have those pairs at four and eight gigahertz. So uh, they're yes. they're widely separated or two and ten. They're very widely separated. Yes. Uh, I can apply a double window function as you as you say, and that's yeah. what I rec uh, that's what I get. That's the type of stuff that we do. We okay. apply those two window functions, if you want, two, two, Gauss, two, two Gaussians around two and, and 10. But when we do that, and we have uh, the right relationship, phase relationship between those two windows, it's not like they're separated. They have a phase relation between the two. And it has to be the right phase relation between the two. And when we do that, we can recover the quadrature of, uh, of, the, of our signal. And we can show that we have it basically, it's, it becomes a, a full mode, a full mode of the electromagnetic field, but with, but with photons at four and eight. So they are, they are in a superposition of four and eight gigahertz. 
Yes, so, so that's a two mode squeeze state, sure, but. Uh, no, it's not a two mode squeeze state. It becomes a, like a single mode squeeze state, but it's a single mode that is delocalized in, in frequency domain at four and eight. It's not the same thing as I have my two modes and I. And, and I uh, okay, so maybe I guess I'm missing something. Maybe we will yes. discuss that at the coffee break. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, I guess uh, we're all asking the same thing because we're trying to wrap our head around this non-causal thing. This is the most provocative thing you brought up, so it generates questions, maybe even on purpose. Uh, it, it's really nice yeah. to, to think about this fundamental issue. So the photon is, is really defined by the mode in which you measure. Yes. And you're determining that by whatever window function you set up, and, and actually our intuition is usually more sort of like a wavelet story. And, and you want to have, uh, in, in the Wigner representation, sort of like w what's called a von Neumann basis, or maybe a tiling of phase space in terms of Gaussian states, each one taking up roughly h bar. Yes. And, and that's sort of the, the intuitive coarse graining we like to think about yes. when we want to say it's localized symmetrically both in space and in time, yes. or in, in whatever. In frequency. So, yeah. Essentially, I guess I'm repeating all the questions that have been here before, is when you do that sort of localization, that, to that degree, that symmetric basis, because the Fourier transform puts all the weight in time, in terms of complete de delocalization in time and, and, and Dirac localization in frequency. But the von Neumann basis is the symmetric one. Yes. And it's an overcomplete basis because they overlap. Yes. But uh, still, it's, it's the intuitive one. And the question is, have you looked at that one maybe as well? I guess it's a complementary uh, suggestion. Uh, yeah, so, so um, you're absolutely right that it's, it's the right basis, I think, to, to, um, to explore these things. Uh, so uh, what that means is that there are some very uh, important relationships between the, the frequencies and they basically have this it's like a cosine, as you. S uh, it's like a cosine. They have the right relationship between the the different frequencies, and that's the basis that you're talking about, and um, that's the one that we use for uh, for our measurements. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so, if I understood well, you're essentially explaining continuous variable. Uh, um, quantum optics, and uh, you just choose one way of representing the signals in time domain, which is uh, just complementary to describing them in frequency domain. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the only difference is first quantization. The, the, the first quantization step is, is different, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, there are trillions of recipes into dealing with uh, continuous variable fr um, quantum optics in frequency domain. Of course, it doesn't look like localized uh, states. It's uh, the itinerant ones. And I mean, at some point, you have a finite bandwidth. So it's just a point of view. Yes. And uh, when you insist on the weird uh, distribution of squeezing, of course, it, it depends on, on into which temporal mode you're projecting it. Yes. And I mean, it is very well known uh, from the optical community of uh, continuous variables, and we even have a very good tool as soon as it is Gaussian, here it's the squeeze state. How already looking at all the covariance matrices in frequency domain, you can not only look at the local squeezing in frequency domain, but look at what would be the, the, uh, the temporal modes of them. Um, I mean, all these tools, uh, as far as I know, are already known. Yes, so, I, uh, yes, what's your question? <laughs> okay, no, I, I was just missing the, uh, the... No, no, but it's, I mean, I mean, I'm interested in the time domain picture. I want to okay. understand it, so it's... Uh, it's uh, but then all these temporal uh, modes appear yeah. directly from the diagonalization of the covariant matrices. I mean, of course, it can have very weird shapes. It will depend on how you tailor your pulses. I understand, I, I understand I, that. It's, it's non-intuitive, but... Uh, I understand, but uh, still, I, I, that's, I wanted to have a different point of view. I want to okay. try to understand what happens in time domain. And I think, uh, at least uh, to me, when, when I do that, even though there are already very well-known things that I can do to, to, to 
do exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm more interested in, in something new, just to try to understand uh, not new physics, but a different point of view that maybe will bring something. Okay, thank you. That's okay, let's take a last question. Uh, hi, so can you just explain a bit more for the cat state? I didn't understand, uh, so in the time domain, what you would measure and, uh, and ultimately how it's different than what you would do conventionally? No, well, so it's just that this, this, is, uh, this is something that you should be able to replicate uh, with you know, uh, just having a cat state and, and doing the tomography as you rotate along the, the phase, uh, um, basically doing a full tomography. Uh, this is just, but this is what I would see in time. It's the same thing, but it's what I would see in time if I gener generated a cat state in a, in a very narrow uh, band uh, um, of frequencies, if I generate a cat state in this and I just put it on, a, on, a, on an oscilloscope, that's what I would see. And that's just something that I was interested but in. But it's, it's multi-valued. It, I'm sorry? I mean, it, uh, it seems like it's multi-valued. I mean, multi yeah, 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 so but that's, that's, well, so on average it's zero. But that's, that's the, the, the beauty of quantum. Basically, this, the, the signal is the noise, right? So what you see is that everything is always zero on average, but there's noise that is not distributed in, in time in always in the same fashion. So I find that fascinating, but... Uh... Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for a little time for discussion. Thank you. <laughs>